Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm excited uh, to have Michael Pertz as our speaker today. Uh, a little background on Michael. Uh, he uh, went to the University of Alberta uh, in engineering where he got both his bachelor's and PhD. And then uh, went off to Chevron for 13 years and is now uh, an associate professor in the UT Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, as well as the Jackson School of Geosciences. Um, he, he loves to teach. Uh, he teaches uh, subsurface data analytics, geostatistics, machine learning. Uh, he's the principal investigator in the College of Natural Sciences for the Freshman Research Initiative in Earth Data Analytics. Uh, he puts his course lectures up on YouTube, so has a big YouTube following. Uh, he's done a Python package uh, for spatial data analytics called Geostats Pi. Uh, in the past few summers, he's been an instructor at the JSG summer uh, research training, uh, and he loves kayaking. So, <laughs> so without further ado, we'll let uh, Michael uh, give his presentation. So thank you, Michael, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Christensen, for the introduction. I do appreciate that. Just to fill in one gap, though, because you might wonder about the jump to engineering. My PhD was co-supervised in the uh, atmosphere, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department at the University of Alberta. And my entire time at Chevron was within the Earth Sciences Department. And so that's my, my claim. My PhD was a joint project in engineering around geologic modeling with geostatistics. All right, so it's a pleasure to be here. I really do appreciate this opportunity. I want to start out with acknowledgements. Let me just give a couple acknowledgements. And first of all, I'm going to show a bunch of work. And you know, the professor's life is to basically stand on the shoulders of incredible students and also collaborators. And so I want to just acknowledge that I will be showing work from a variety of different PhD students that I work with and also from other professors within my department and elsewhere that I work with. So I just want to give credit. Um, thank you very much for the invite. It's my pleasure to be here. I really do want to share ideas about the interaction between AI. Now, I've heard it said once that you know it's artificial intelligence is only used in slide decks. Um, you know, what I'm talking about is data analytics and machine learning with geoscience and subsurface engineering. I see huge opportunities and I think it's going to be, we're in the digital revolution. And I want to tell you something. What I want to tell you is that we're actually in a great position. We're in fact ahead of many other scientific and engineering disciplines. So I want to talk to you about that, give you that message. Just a couple more things about myself. If I seem like I don't know what I'm doing, I'm brand new at being a professor. I've only been a professor for, I don't know, about four years or so. I have a team now of about 15 graduate students, PhDs that I work with. I also teach and conduct research in these topics. I do appreciate, actually, many of you have sent students to my courses, and they've been great. Actually, the geoscience students have been phenomenal in my geostats course and my machine learning course. So thank you so much for your trust and opportunity to work with your students. I have about 13 years of experience in industry. I was working in the area of geoscience, engineering, data science. Specifically, um, I was working in building geological models and using data analytics and machine learning and so forth, more statistical learning back then. But while I'm here in academia, I remain active in industry. I taught like something like 1,700 working professionals in 2020. And so I'm teaching a lot of courses. Join us at GeoGolf, if I may say so. We have a short course the Saturday afterwards on machine learning. I would love to see more people join in. Okay, if you want to learn more, if I say something that you find interesting, there, here's an open invite. Check out, I share all of my university lectures, well-documented examples and code. I share all of that online for free to support students and working professionals. In fact, I could almost be introduced as the geostats guy now. When I go to companies, I have people call me the geostats guy. It's kind of funny. But I do have all of my lectures on my YouTube channel, and more importantly, hundreds of well-documented workflows, including the package in Geostats, um, available on my GitHub account. Okay, I'm actually really curious right now if I can ask a question. Let me see if I can find the dialogue participants. Okay, by show of hands, who uses GitHub? Anybody here in the group using GitHub? Show of hands. 
All right, there you go, Duncan, Dr. Christensen, Dr. Abma, I see you, Dr. Trugman, thank you very much. You all get full credit for that. I am so excited to see such a number of people using GitHub. What I tell my students now is if you put on your CV that you work in Python, data analytics, machine learning, and you don't have code contributes contributions to open source that people can point to, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the same strength. And so I really do encourage people and to all the faculty contributing to open source, thank you so much. That's so awesome. Um, we represent UT very well in doing that. Okay, what's my motivation for my discussion today? What I want to do is I want to talk about the fact that we have this wave of artificial intelligence, data science, going across science and engineering, everybody. Um, I have people from chemical engineering taking my course. I have geomechanical engineers taking my courses. Um, there's all over campus, over natural sciences. We have students from all over the place in our energy analytics program. But what I want to tell you is this. Subsurface is unique. And in many ways, we are further down the path than any of the other disciplines. It's true. And we have a history. We have a shared experience in this field. And I want to share it with you to basically talk about, we should be confident. We should be really excited about this. We have a lot we can share with other engineering and scientific disciplines. Okay, so let me go ahead. What I'm gonna do is in my discussion, I'll cover geoscience and subsurface engineering, I, this is review, but then I'm going to talk about why we're unique. Then I'll talk about what we already know. This is the part where I'm going to say, you know what, we should be confident. And then I'm going to talk about what we're learning. And here's where I'm going to shamelessly share some of my student research and talk about interesting insights from it. Okay. Dr. Christensen, do we accept questions during or are they all afterwards? Um, so usually you do them afterwards. If there's a, a burning question, we can do it uh, during, but uh, it, it helps the flow if we wait till later. Okay. Okay. If anybody has a burning question or some confusion or, or a clarification question, I'm happy to answer during it. I'm going to preach to the choir, as we say in Texas. At this point, I'm going to talk about subsurface modeling. And the fundamental geostatistical workflow proceeds as following. It's an amazing data integration challenge. I, I think about the wonderful times that I had wandering around the Karoo Basin with Nick Drinkwater and Dr. Flint, or when I wandered around Einsa with Morgan Sullivan or Ross Formation. The ability of these great experts to put together data sets from so many different different types of data, different scales of data, and be able to formulate the history of the basin is just fascinating to me. I, I always love that. But we, we integrate all of our data together in order to formulate or extract quantitative descriptions of the subsurface, trends, spatial statistics. Then what we do is we take that information, we build an ensemble of models. The models represent the uncertainty of the subsurface. Why? Uh, uncertainty is our friend. We have very sparse data. We have very heterogeneous, vast systems to work with, and we have to work with many different data types, and all of our data has uncertainty. The result is we have uncertainty in everything we do. Then we take those models, we subject them to a transfer function. The transfer function is just a fancy term for volumetric calculations, uh, flow simulation, contaminant concentrations and their flux or flow throughout the subsurface, uh, saturations. Okay, that leads us to a decision criteria by which we can support decision making for development or remediation in the subsurface. All right, so this is the general workflow we've been using. Now, what's very interesting is that we have sparse data. We integrate a lot of different data and we have very expensive high value decisions that we must support. Anybody know how much it costs to drill a well in the Gulf of Mexico? Deep water? You can unmute yourself. Anybody want to make an estimate? Say between 300 uh, million and 500 million. I like that. The order of magnitude sounds very good to me. Anybody else want to jump in? I think that's very good. I've, I've seen, I know during the high time when things were all at $110 per barrel, um, I, we were definitely seeing up to about 300 million if you had a well test. No, definitely. These are the types of numbers we're talking about. Can we afford to put those in the wrong location? No, 
No, that's terrible. We have development budgets, um, exploration development appraisal budgets that are basically, well, just appraisal can be a, more, much more than a billion dollars. Like it's, it's crazy the amount we can spend. So this all drove us to data-driven methods early. So this digital revolution, this data science revolution, we've been stuck there for a long time. We had to do that. What is our shared history that we should be proud of? This is how it goes. If you look at it, if you go back into history, you can go back, if we're gonna talk about stats and data and probabilities, we should go back to Kolmogorov. And it's funny, it's not that long ago, early 1900s, the, develop of the development of fundamental probability axioms, concepts of stationarity that are critical for geosciences. Then it was gold mining with Danny, Craig, and Sitchell. They were developing the initial concepts of how do you estimate a gold grade away from the drill hole or the blast hole. And this was very important. This is how we know how to excavate efficiently, economically, and hopefully safely, and remove the best grades, get the best rock out, uh, reliable feed to the run of mine pile. And then what happened later on, and quite a bit later, Matheron came along and added the theory on top of Danny Craig and Sitchell's work in making spatial estimates in geology. And that was where the term geostatistics was coined. Later, Journal from Stanford, Verily, Deutsch was my PhD advisor. They're the ones who made it very popular and accessible. Open source development in GS Live, for example. And this is what led to wide application within all types of different geoscience settings. And of course, that's carried on even now. What do we know from this? We know that because of complicated, heterogeneous, sparsely sampled vast systems, We've been driven to work with fourth paradigm methodologies for a long, long time, a very long time. In fact, let me just stop right here. Has anybody ever welcomed you to the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery? Anybody ever done that? No. Let me, let, it is my great honor, Dr. Christensen, to personally welcome you to the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery. Isn't it exciting? Think about it. Who got to be around for some of these previous paradigms when we changed the way we saw the world? Well, the first paradigm was empirical science. Uh, archaeologists dig up all kinds of crazy stuff, which reminds me that I'm glad I was not alive thousands of years ago. Like the experiments they were doing medically, uh, kind of scary stuff, right? The, but, but we learned by doing experiments, we could observe the natural settings and learn about the world. Theoretical science, we could put equations to things. We could understand their shapes and forms. That was pretty exciting, right? Very compact. Of course, then the third paradigm is computational science. What was that? The world's heterogeneous. The geometries are complicated. Many things are coupled. And so we couldn't solve it with simple analytical expressions. We needed to put it in a computer and run the simulation. And then finally, the fourth paradigm, data-driven science. Now, if anybody here in the room wants to argue with me, and say 2010s is too late, this is the third wave of AI or the fourth wave of AI, depending on how you count it, we can move it back. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm cool with that. I get that, it's been happening for a while. I respect that. So, but the idea of detecting patterns, anomalies from big data, using artificial intelligence to try to find these patterns, this is all the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery. Now, every company I go and visit, they talk about this. I, have you guys all been out to the industry recently? They're all talking about brand new teams and all of our disciplines in geoscience and engineering trying to figure out what to do with data, to use it better. In fact, Deloitte did a study across many sectors of our economy. And what they found is everybody's struggling with this right now. They're all trying to do something about it. And when they looked at different types of groups, different types of companies, what they found was that life sciences and healthcare were near the trailing edge when it came to proportion of organizations with what they deemed was high maturity, high readiness to use the technologies. They put TMT near the top, tech, media, telecom, okay, fine, they can have the bleeding edge. And then they put us, energy. Energy would describe kind of a lot of the subsurface types of studies and work and so forth. And they put us somewhere near the middle of the pack. We're not alone. All of us are facing this in our society right now, facing the challenge. But what is our message about working in the fourth paradigm? Let me ask you this question. When we move to the second paradigm, theoretical science, did we throw away the first paradigm? Did we say, ah, oh, we don't need to experiment anymore. We have theoretical science. No, no, it was built on experimentation. 
Anybody here work in computer simulation? It is a combination of theoretical and empirical. I remember we were working on the problem of turbidity currents and trying to understand entrainment of grains from the beds. We didn't have a theoretical science to support that. We're using flume experiments and we're looking, looking at those calculations. And so we never throw away the previous paradigms, we augment them. So we continue to use our entire toolkit. Has anybody been told that they need to be a data scientist? Has anybody been told that you need to make data scientists? Has anyone heard the term unicorn? Unicorn is kind of like nails on the chalkboard to me, to be honest. It's just not very helpful or descriptive. What do I suggest? Well, I've been approached by many companies that talk to me about data scientists, and they show me this Venn diagram. I had meetings with Google and other tech companies, and they talk about domain expertise, statistics, and coding. That's what they're looking for as far as that employee who can be called a data scientist. What I say is that if we want geoscientists and engineering data scientists, what we need to do is we should continue to develop our expertise. What we found in all of our experiences is that the main expertise is the most important component. And, and I think we all can agree that's something you can't learn on the weekend. That's something that takes a lot of time to develop. Then what we can do is we already do good things with statistics. I'm going to suggest something right now, see if it's controversial. Data analytics is statistics. Everybody good with that? Data analytics is statistics. There's been rebranding. At AAPG, I gave a talk and I used, I said that and everybody clapped. People are just, every, I think that's what's going on. And guess what? We were good at this and we still are good at this. We do a lot with statistics. Our geostatistics is great. And so we continue to build on that. We also understand how to handle our data. We know how to sample. And so we build on data curation, data handling. That's very important. Now we continue to grow our capability. You know, let me just say something. I'm going to say it. All undergrad students have a little bit of hesitancy to learn coding. Would you agree with that? Engineering, geoscience students, many, no, I shouldn't say all, but many do. And what I found is that's very interesting is people ask me if there's a difference between engineering and geoscience students. And I say, no. I find many great geoscience students who are just jumping right, right to learn coding and are doing great things with coding. I see it in all of my classes. We continue to grow that. But when I talk about coding, I'm not talking about the five years of full stack development that I did in geologic modeling in C++. Those were dark days that I do not wish upon anyone. Searching for hanging pointers and memory leaks. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to script to put together workflows using open source. That's really what I think we need to achieve. So I think this is our opportunity to develop capabilities in this field. What can we say about, what can we, how can we summarize what I've just said about us? I can say we were driven to early adoption of data-driven methods. We've been fourth paradigm before many. In fact, what I tell people is that we were big data long before tech even knew what big data was. That's what I say. Um, we integrate all scientific paradigms, so we're not being replaced by AI and a machine. No, no. We use those methods in concert with ourselves to work together. We succeed by building on our geoscience and engineering strengths. Okay, let me move to another phase of the discussion. Let's talk about what do we already know. And let me go through a couple of things. I think this is kind of interesting. I'm going to provide you maybe some very basic concepts around this. First thing is big data. How do you know if you work with big data? Show of hands, who here works with big data? Who does big data analytics? Anyone? Daniel, I see you. Dr. Dr. Amma, I see you. Zhang, I see a bunch of people. Yes, Dr. Young, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate that. All right. How do you know? For those of you who didn't put your hands up, I bet we can increase the number. And the way we could is let's look at the criteria for big data. You can claim you work with big data if you have enough of these criteria. The Vs, volume, velocity, variety, variability, and veracity. Okay, let's see how we're doing. Do you have many samples difficult to handle and visualize? High dimensionality, so you can't just look at it. Large data sets that take a long time to work with, to render. How many people have that? What I say is when we gather geophysical information in the Gulf of Mexico, our data transmission rates rival JPL, NASA, Google. We have massive amounts of data that we work with. 
check that box, we have volume. Velocity, high rate of collection, continuous relative to the decision-making cycle. What I, tech people say velocity means real-time data. I, I push back against that. What I say, is it continuous relative to your decision-making cycle? In other words, the complexity of your workflows. We know in our field that we're always chasing the bit. We're trying to keep up with new data and update, reprocess seismic. There's always something happening. We're struggling to keep up. Check the box, we have velocity. Variety data from various sources, with various types and scales. Do I need to say anything? I bet we have people in the room who work with poor scale data. We have people in the room who work with basin scale data. We work across all scales. Variability, data acquisition changes during the project. Oh yes. Um, we have amazing projects which have been around for about a hundred years. Were they doing the same petrophysical logs? Were they running the same type of geophysical? One, we have 2D geophysical to 3D to 4D. It changes, check that box. And veracity, let me challenge you. Do we have a single type of data that has no uncertainty? Is there any data that we deal with that has no uncertainty? I don't think so. It's, it's funny, sometimes in my petroleum engineers, they'll, they'll say, well, production has no uncertainty. Has anybody been out in the field and seen how they meter that? And where did it come from, right? It's, it's really everything we do has uncertainty. Many geoscience and engineering fields now deal with big data. You're probably, many of you are working with big data. Big data analytics, statistics is about collecting, organizing, interpreting data, as well as drawing conclusions to support decision-making. If you don't impact the decision, you don't add value with statistics. Data analytics, look up the definition. I can never find a distinction between data analytics and statistics. Sometimes people talk about visualization, beta, data, um, business data analytics, and so forth. Nah, I don't see a real difference. And if you work with spatial data, cool. Spatial big data analytics. That's awesome. I wish I wrote the book. Somebody came out with a book, Spatial Big Data Analytics. I wish I could read it in my previous book. Machine learning. What is it? Let's demystify it really quickly. If you go to Google and you search it, um, go to, you search and you go to Google, um, Google, you'll find the Wikipedia page. And if you go there, you'll find a quote like this. Study of algorithms or mathematical models. There's more than one model. It's a toolkit. Computer systems that use to progressively improve their performance. Okay, they're learning. Machine learning algorithms build mathematical models, sample data known as training data, a toolkit of learning algorithms based on training data in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to perform that task. Ah, oh, they're general. One model can work on a wide variety of problems. Okay, so far so good. A lot of people stop there. If you read to the very end of the article, you'll find the following. Where it is infeasible to develop an algorithm of specific instructions for performing the task. What does that mean? If you, if you know the physics, if you know, you understand the geoscience processes, you understand the data to a great degree, don't use a machine to try to figure it out. It's not a panacea solution. In fact, a really great quote, and this was from Dr. Torres Verdin, also appointed over in Jackson School, he talked about the fact that don't use data science as a crutch instead of learning the fundamental geoscience and engineering principles, which I thought was fascinating. And I see a lot of that going on where people just jump right to machine learning data-driven methods. What does machine learning look like? Anytime somebody says deep learning, or anytime somebody talks to you about random forest, or even convolutional neural nets or GANs or something, Remember that fundamentally, this is what it is. You have a bunch of inputs. Those are predictor features. If you're an old school statistician, those are the independent variables. And you have a function that takes you to the output, the response feature. Old school statisticians would say the dependent variable or variables. And this is all it is. It's just formulating a statistical data-driven model to make these predictions. St machine learning is statistical learning that's the title of the book from Hasty and All and James and All. They, they agree with that. What is the basic methodology for machine learning? What's the basic workflow? I have one slide and I show the whole thing. This is how it goes. You're gonna take all of your data. You take the data. I'm trying to predict permeability given an elevation, a very simple depth trend, something going on, compaction. And um, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that data and we'll remove a certain fraction as testing data, the solid circles. We take those, we hide them away somewhere. 
Then what we do next is we'll retain the training data, the X's, and we're gonna build a model where we're gonna train the model parameters to the X's. We get the very best fit model. We'll minimize error, like mean squared error or something like that. And then you'll increase the model complexity like a first order polynomial to third order to fifth order to seventh order polynomial. And then what you're gonna do is you get the best fit model for each one of those levels of model complexity. Then you bring back the testing data, you see how it performs and you retain the model that has the best fit. What are we doing? We're tuning the complexity of the model. It's called hyperparameter tuning to get the very best model to perform away from data. Why? If you take the model that performs best at data, which model would you pick? You would always pick the most complicated model and how well would that perform at withheld data or new problems? Very poorly. It'll be overfit. So we pick the model that has the best fit with the testing data. That's the overall workflow. Very simple. In fact, many times you look at these machine learning workflows, that's where the tradecraft is, is getting the right level of complexity for good predictions. Now, many of us who work in numerical methods understand optimization. And what's fascinating to me is the fact that the, in fact, Many of the deep learning methods, of course, they don't have an analytical solution to train all of those parameters. And so they use optimization like stochastic gradient descent. So what's fascinating is if you understand optimization with stochastic gradient descent or other types of methods, then you in fact will understand much of the tradecraft used to do deep learning. And so there's another connection for us and a great opportunity for us to have high impact. All right, so what do we already know? Well, we already, I think many of us already work with big data, even if we didn't know it. I think data analytics is statistics, and we have a long history of working with statistics to understand the subsurface and geostatistics, so we know about that. Machine learning is statistical learning, so we're just building on the statistical mindset and approach. And Geoscience and engineering concepts are core to everything we do. Domain knowledge, expertise, as we train the future individuals to be able to face the digital revolution, the subsurface, optimization concepts, data integration, Bayesian updating. I could go into so many topics, spatial debiasing. All of these concepts are critical to our application of machine learning. And we're, we're good at that. We know about these things. Okay, what are we learning? How's your energy level? How are we all doing? Double thumbs up. I do appreciate that enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Let's carry on. We'll talk about what we're learning. Here's where I shamelessly show some of our research results, and I'll make comments about what they taught us. This is going to be rapid fire of new developments in subsurface data analytics and machine learning. Okay, let's first talk about assisted interpretation. So this seems very logical. I, I love, I got reading. I've got um, a variety of books. Uh, geez, what I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, Walker and James. I have those books with the great images of depositional settings and type logs. I love that stuff. And so it seems very natural to take that and put that into image-based deep learning like convolutional neural nets and GANs, generative adversarial networks, and figure out how we can make improved predictions or supported predictions. And so we've done that. Working with Dr. Torres Verdin and our student Wen Pen, we've been looking at going through and automatically detecting depositional settings from well logs. Now, something very interesting happens there. What we've been finding is that when we do this and we compare it to analysis from core data, is we find that using engineered features is a very good idea. What does that mean? If you have some type of engineering geoscience knowledge about rock quality and how we can kind of rank rock types, or if we have knowledge about specific types of patterns or information from the subsurface, put it in the model. We do much better if we get your domain expertise as much as possible. The other thing we found, and I hope this doesn't surprise anyone, if you set the machine loose on uncorrelated wells with no straddle correlation design. In other words, you haven't done anything to try to break it up into stationary depositional domains. It will fail. It will do very poorly. Because what's happening is you're just throwing everything in the hopper. 
all of the all of the signals and it will tend to get very confused you can greatly improve accuracy when you incorporate your geologic interpretations to guide the machine and so we see it very much as being a partnership to get the best possible result the other thing we find interesting is the machine can tell you when something anomalous or unusual happened and you can use that as a check on your interpretations what did we learn deep learning just like geostatistics that we've been doing for decades we need to build our model on a framework of geoscience and engineering we can't just let the statistics take, take care of the problem let's talk a little bit about feature engineering one of the problems we run into and i'm going to tell you this i'm going to be kind of angry now is that we have a whole bunch of features we have a bunch of different measures and we have a bunch of different samples and people just take it and they put it in a table it's called a data frame within pandas and python or whatever it is if you're working in different types of coding languages and then they treat the problem like a multivariate analysis they lose the spatial domain one of the most critical components of our problems is the spatial context and so what we've been doing is we've been looking at a variety of ways we can incorporate the spatial context into the features okay how many people here have heard of dispersion variance show of hands Anybody heard of the concept dispersion variance? Oh, this is a great day. I get to introduce something new to people. I love that. That gets me really excited. Okay, so did you know that the variance, everybody knows variance, right? Population sample variance is a specific case of dispersion variance for the case of point support data within the population. It turns out dispersion variance is a methodology for variance that accounts for the scale of the sample and the scale of the domain over which you're working, your area of interest or volume of interest. And so dispersion variance actually accounts for heterogeneity and scale and trends and stationarity, continuity, uh, paleo flow directions. It's all incorporated in dispersion variance. Very, very powerful. Okay, so what we did was it was a very simple idea. I know the permeability along a well, but if I understand the rock type and the facies, I should know something about the permeability continuity away from the well. If I know that, I can build a model, say the barogram of permeability, and then I can calculate the dispersion variance. Now the dispersion variance tells me about the degree of variability within the well and between the wells. I then use that as a brand new feature to predict and forecast production over wells. And it actually works. It turns out that when we do this, we improve our predictions. Why? Because measures like Dijkstra Parsons, which is a measure of dispersion or variance within the permeability, are not sufficient. We need to account for the spatial context, the scales. Spatial context is essential to everything we do. There's so many great ways we can bring it into machine learning predictive models. Now, anybody here ever worked with dynamic time warping? I believe Zoltan Sylvester, my good friend over there, he, he was working with some of this um, last little while ago. Daniel, uh, Dr. Trugman, thank you very much for sharing that. Good to hear you're working on it too. It's a fascinating area. It's a really neat idea. Let me show you a basic example. It goes like this. I have water injected over time, and I have this signal of production from a twinned nearby production well. What I need to do, it's a single a signal mapping problem. Can I look at the structure of the water injection and find its imprint in the production? And so when I do that, I identify this segment right here. The way that we do it is by mapping the lowest cost path, the optimum warping path through what's known as a cumulative cost matrix. And it's really cool. You can visualize it. This line, in fact, is the mapping from this signal, the orange line, to the blue line, which is on the y-axis. And so this path, if it was, you could imagine if you have a, a vertical section, it means that you have a convergence and so forth. What we found was that if you apply this methodology to try to map production, we know something about the physical behavior of production, effective and diffusive behaviors. Specifically, let me just give you a simple example. If I inject water, would it make any sense for it to affect production before the injection? like back to the future, time travel? No, that shouldn't happen. Or would it make any sense if I inject water that it would cause like kind of a convergence that I take this signal and converge it to one point? That doesn't make sense. Now, if you're using this for stratigraphic, 
correlation, like Zoltan and others are, uh, Dr. Sylvester and others are, in that case, that means that's a hiatal surface. That's a unconformity. And that's fine. That can happen, but not in production. So what we started to do was we started to incorporate the physics of advection, diffusion, and a knowledge about the heterogeneity to impose on that cost function. And it actually turned out we got better estimates. So what did we learn? We could use our geoscience knowledge about the subsurface to improve dynamic time warping. Have you guys ever heard the statement garbage in, garbage out? Let me propose an addition, bias in, bias out. Let me show it to you. It goes like this. If I was to take a variety of different data sets, do you, look very carefully at this data set. Purple are the high values. The greens are the low values. Can you see how I sampled preferentially in the good stuff? I have higher density of sampling in the good stuff. Look at this right here. That's uniform sampling that should be representative. Okay, what we did was we took different levels of bias in spatially sampled data from a geologic setting. And then what we did is we trained a machine learning method for prediction. The question is this, if you train with biased data from space and make predictions even with unbiased prediction sets, will there still be a bias? And guess what the answer was? When we looked at many, many cases, what we found was that if you had bias in the training, that bias got propagated directly to the model. And so a lot of people don't realize that, that when you work with machine learning methods, they think that there's some type of auto bias going on, some type of correction going on in it. Nope, nope. And so what's that mean? We have to take ownership of our data sets. And you know what I say? If you have a sparsely sampled subsurface data set, assume that it's biased until proven otherwise. And if it is biased, what did we find out? Wendy Liu, from my, my, um, one of my PhD students, found out that we can actually weight the machine. And that's what we're doing right here. The size of the circles are varying based on their representative weights. And the result is the machine changes and we can somewhat mitigate the bias in the training. So I wanna welcome people to consider bias in, bias out. And all of, many of our data sets are biased. So we're gonna to have to address this problem. All right, anomalies are impactful. What about spatial anomalies? What Wendy has also done is looked at a methodology in space to detect anomalies. Let me give you a simple example. If you look down here, you see how I have a data set? The question is this, this data and this data together, is that relationship anomalous? Would you expect that degree of transition or change over that distance within that geologic setting? What we've actually done is we've used the Veragram. And people don't, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but the Veragram actually, under some assumptions like bivariate Gaussianity, and you can transform and get there, actually provides an entire PDF of the relationship between tail and head values. In other words, what would, what's here? What would I expect to happen over here? And so that distribution, we can place ourselves for any pair of data and identify anomalous pairs. What's an anomaly? Pairs that exist within low density, low probability locations on this plot. When we do that, we get plots like this. We did a tessellation, a regular kind of Delaunay tessellation right here of the data set to get a bunch of pairs in space. And then we calculated the probabilities from those densities given the assumptions of the distribution. And we're able to calculate the purple are low probability associations. In other words, do you see this wall right here? That wall right there? They are anomalous rel relative to their neighbors. This entire region is anomalous relative to its neighbors. There might've been a facies transition that we did not detect. So this is a form of anomaly detection. I call it spatial data analytics to support spatial machine learning for sure. This is very important because it turns out that many machine learning methods use an L2 norm, which means they're very sensitive to outliers. So we've got to be very careful about putting outliers in. I'm going to jump through a couple of topics right here. Let me just, because I want to give, um, may I ask Dr. Christensen, how much time should I leave at the end for questions? Uh, if you could leave, uh, if you could end in about uh, eight minutes. Okay, I'll do that. I, I'll commit to that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Another thing, we'll, we have, another problem we have is that machine learning and deep learning, getting into deep learning now, they need good training models. In fact, what's very interesting is that machine learning models are very hungry for data. Now, how do we get those training models? 
Well, it turns out that we could try to use like modern analogs. We could try to use high resolution, shallow seismic. We could use outcrops. You know, there, there's so many ways we can try to gather this information, flume experiments, but it can be very difficult to get a very nice, diverse and densely sampled training set to work with. And so what we've been doing, one of my students, Hong Gong Zhou, actually my first PhD, solo PhD to graduate this summer, which was very nice, and gone off the BP. Hong Gong Zhou, what he did was, I should say Dr. Zhou now, what he did was, in fact, he made algorithms that are known as rule-based subsurface models. And the way they work is this. They use rules to mimic depositional processes. Generally, um, the depositional processes, you could get into like post-depositional alteration. That would be very cool too, uh, diagenesis and so forth. But really we've been doing just the regular deposition. And so what we do is we can get, here's a section through a model that uses rules to get depositional lobes. So they're kind of compensational like lobes that you'd see in the Wilcox, lower Wilcox formation. And we can then put all kinds of trend models into them and form from outcrops and so forth. What we do then is we take those models and we check them analytic, like statistically, quantitatively against what's observed within outcrops and other data sets. We use specifically measures like the compensation index from Kyle Straub. Very, very useful statistic. You can calculate in 1D, 2D, 3D, very, very useful. And so we compare our models and we use that to tune our models to have realistic patterns to them. And so what we do when we've done that, well, you're now sitting on a library of realistic high resolution heterogeneity models, so we can't help ourselves. We start doing design of experiments. We start trying to analyze and understand relationships between different depositional type of components and operational components and what actually happens with regard to, say, production. And so we can talk about what is statistically significant, negative or positive impact um, with regard to, in fact, if you change the size of the depositional lobe, it turns out that that has a negative impact on late stage production. Fascinating. Uh, it turns out that baffling effect of having many lobes and the way they stack with each other actually uh, gives you better flow as far as sweep efficiency. Okay, so we can do that type of thing, but we can also train deep learning models. Okay, what do we learn? Deep learning needs good training models, and we can use our knowledge of the depositional settings, quantitative measures to check our models, and we can come up with great libraries to support deep learning. I think this will be an extremely valuable component of supporting machine learning in the future. What about subsurface models directly from deep learning? I'm, I'm excited about this. In fact, Hong Gong Zhou, Wen Pan, Eduardo Maldonado, other students of mine are all working on these types of topics. It turns out that we can do things we never did with geostatistics. We can build models that in fact have the correct geologic structures conditional to well and seismic information. Here's an example right here where we show an input model. It's a very simple model for demonstration, compensational lobes with a simple vertical trend within the lobe elements. And then what we show is that we go from a generative adversarial network, which was training initially doing a terrible job. It's just random behavior. Then what happens is that as we train it up, we get closer and closer to the types of patterns we see within the training models. Now, what's fascinating is we can take these models and project them into a low dimensional space. Anybody here ever worked with multidimensional scaling? Show of hands, anybody ever done multidimensional scaling? It's a fascinating idea. What it uses as an input is a measure of dissimilarity between the models. And so every one of these points is a model. These are the, the red are our generated models, the blue are our training models. And you can see that as we train it up, by the time we get to the end, they're overlapping with each other very, very well. We're covering the entire space of uncertainty. My good friend at Stanford, who does basically what I do here at UT, Dr. Kares, tells us that that is the space of uncertainty visualized in a lower dimensional projection, which I think is fascinating, really interesting. Well, as we train these models up, they get, they get amazing. You can actually start to do downscaling of seismic information, fill in our slope valleys in deep water, say Gulf of Mexico or West Africa, with our channelized weakly confined or fully confined type of channel systems. 
and they're consistent across all scales. We can build uncertainty models that span a variety of different um, scenarios. They're very, very powerful models, and they're conditional to all information. In fact, um, I think people have probably seen Zoltan Sylvester's models with these meandering models. Well, that's the type of models we use for training, and we can actually reproduce. This is from the machine conditional to seismic and well data, we're actually able to impose this type of structure. This is better than we've ever, ever been able to do with geostatistics in the past. I get really excited. These models are fully multi-scale and we know fundamentally the geosciences are very multi-scale going from bed scale to element to scale, complex, complex set, depending what schemes you use. And we can now build models that go across all of these scales and have the right type of stacking patterns and behaviors. So deep learning is giving us the first opportunity to build truly multi-scale realistic subsurface models conditional to all of our, our knowledge and our inputs. And those training models that we made that are checked against natural settings. I get very excited. What about forecasting in the subsurface? Javier Santos working along with Dr. Perdonovich, we've been looking at how do we build models to predict flow rates within the subsurface pore scale. And what's very interesting is we used a, you know, regular type of computational methods to do this. What, what we'd find is that it would take us just days on a supercomputer to calculate high resolution velocity fields right here. And so what we're able to do is we use convolutional neural nets with some feature engineering. We can get models of the inter the intergranular scale of flow at high resolution in hundreds or thousands of a second. And we're starting to work across scales. We've gotten to the point where we go from poor scale to bed scale. And we want to go even further as this. The dream is that we can look at cementation patterns, diagenesis at the very small scale and immediately get feedback on how that affects recovery factor and so forth of different fluids from the subsurface. Okay, efficient multi-scale flow surrogate models are really, really powerful. And this can be very helpful to us. I want to talk about one more topic. I know that I'm running out of time, but I'm going to be very quick about this. Uncertainty is critical to everything we do. I'm gonna make a strong statement. Deep learning, machine learning methods are not developed to build good uncertainty models. In fact, machine learning is overly focused on accuracy of the estimate, not uncertainty. What we've been doing with one of my students, Eduardo Maldonado, is we've been looking at how we can tune the uncertainty in the model to have a good uncertainty model. I'm not gonna have time to explain all this, but we can actually tune it so that when we have a variety of models, that they represent a good range of uncertainty given the problem. And we have a way to test that in cross-validation against the data. So I get really excited about this. Uncertainty is more important for us in the subsurface than accuracy of the estimate. And we need to do more. I can send you the citation for that paper if you're interested. Can I give you an invitation here at the very end? If anybody is watching this and said, you know what? I like to do a little more data science. I like to do some data analytics. I like to do some machine learning, but I haven't really tried yet. Please take your phone, take a picture of that QR code right there. That will take you to my new lecture series. It's a lecture series with live code, Jupyter Notebooks using the RISE package. So I have live code within the slides and it goes through very basic fundamental building blocks all the way up to predictive machine learning and pipelines for very efficient machine learning um, construction, workflow construction. So check this out. I think it should be very accessible for anyone to follow. I'd love to see. Let me know how it goes. Let me know if it's helpful. And I welcome suggestions for additional lectures. OK, I'm one minute late. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you. Everyone do their clapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so um, uh, what does Constantino says? Oh, oh, he's telling me that, uh, that he's in the room by himself. Okay, um, so uh, I'm ready to take uh, questions. So uh, does anyone have a, a question for Michael? Um, and while and if anyone, that, anyone's, in, anyone's intimidated with my <laughs> name, just think the fish, perch. <laughs> Um, so while we're waiting for that, uh, I'll say, so, so uh, some of us work with um, scientific ocean drilling. Um, and uh, I mean, I think a lot of the, you know, these techniques should be very similar. So, so one, one thing I was thinking of uh, that I've seen some, a little bit of work on is um, when we core, we don't get 100% recovery. 
And so we're always trying to figure out what we're missing. And um, so, so I, I've seen some machine learning trying to, to do that, um, but I'm sure you know, that could go a lot further. Um, uh, so for example, we can, um, we get our samples and we also do downhole logs, uh, including some imaging. Uh, so I could imagine trying to, some people have tried to take like imaging together with some of those values and then the measurements you make and then your um, assessment of what you're looking at to, to try to build, build a, a, you know, a framework of what you're missing. Um, because because I think there's biasing in what's actually recovered because you're not recovering some of the, the, the good stuff. Um, yeah. and, and so thank you very much for that question. If you ignore every time that you miss the sample, that's effectively what we call likewise deletion. And likewise deletion is the worst. It's the worst. It's so bad because the, the problem is this, most of the time when you have a missing sample in any scientific domain, rarely is it going to be missing at random. It's going to be missing because of something. There's some confounding feature and it'll cause a bias if we do likewise deletion. So what I suggest is that we always think about some form of feature imputation. And so feature imputation, I do have lectures on my YouTube channel where I deal with a variety of methods by which if you're missing some of the features, i.e. the actual core samples and what you measure from the core, using the other available logs to try to estimate it, there's a whole variety of ways to do it. My suggestion, don't be tempted by very simple methods. Um, there's some methods that try to do things like just re replace with the average of all, replace with the average of maybe recent samples. Those methodologies may look okay, but they will wreck correlation structures by creating artificial features or structures within your correlation. So I would suggest always try to do some form of imputation. And if you're doing imputation, do blind checks, do actual cross validation, leave some out and see how well your imputation really performs. Okay. Now, yeah, yeah, thanks. May, uh, one more thing, if I may, one more thing, if I may, there's a whole branch of data debiasing known as soft data debiasing. I have a lecture on my YouTube channel also. It's a fascinating area that people do not do enough of. And it's this idea of using available information to fill in missing information. And what I really like about it is it does accept expert knowledge. Like if you know something about the faces, assemblages, the architectures, the relationships between features, you can impose that in a very nice intuitive manner. So soft data debiasing might also be an option. Okay. Thanks. Oh, I got those terms. And it's okay. simple and interpretable. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, Duncan, go ahead. Oh, yeah, a very interesting talk. Um, so are there any general principles? You alluded to some of them, I think, but in terms of training data to watch out for, particularly if humans are in the loop. Um, and, and, and thank you very much. There's so many different directions we can go. Can I, let me start with one direction. You redirect me if I'm going the wrong direction for you. Fair train and test splitting is a huge problem. The default methodology that people use within scikit-learn is random selection of 30 or 25% or 20% of the data to withhold. And if you think about it, if you put that in a spatial context, if I had a bunch of wells and I have well logs with sampling at something like half a foot intervals, my cross-validation problem is generally estimating half a foot away from an existing data point. You see, that's a very easy estimation problem. Now you're going to train the model and use it to predict at a pre-drill prediction, a pre-drill location, like a kilometer away or half a kilometer away or something like that. That's one of the major issues we have is fair train test split. Now I have a student who just submitted a paper, I believe it was just accepted, in which we demonstrate the idea of considering the difficulty of the planned real use of the model and then imposing the same distribution difficulty in the training test split. I think that's the first comment I'd make about it. The other thing is this, I think about the philosopher Hume. And what did they teach us? And I'll paraphrase, you can't know what you haven't seen. You know, so, so when it comes to training data, I really do doubt the degree to which deep learning can truly extrapolate with, from the training data. I really do. I also question its ability to work with what we have all the time, we call in geostats non-stationarity. 
I am I have a student working on that right now, and I have my suspicions that if you have two depositional settings existing superimposed due to unconformities or transitions in the subsurface in your training, I suspect that you will not get a great model. I, I, I suspect it'll be like what we learned from multiple point simulation in geostats. It's going to be a mixture of the two. It'll become ambiguous in the predictions. Okay, those are two. Does that help, Dr. Young? Are those, are those useful? Yes, yeah. No, that's a um, good perspective. Thank you. All right. A great question. I think I think training is critical. And I also think it's a massive area where we in the geoscience contribute. Huge. And, and, and we can't understate it. Yes. Ne next question. Uh, yeah, uh, Syed. Sure. Um, great presentation. And um, I think it sort of continues based on the previous question is, uh, and you mentioned, you know, we can bring different type of data for training. Uh, I just wanted to be, how do you feel about like you have different types of data and you can create some data using numerical simulations and numerical tools. Um, how do you feel about combining these things for training? So, so I, I really like the idea of using physics to help create the training. I think, I think it's a great idea. In fact, when you think about scientific machine learning, it's all about how we can pose the physics, the, the boundary conditions, the, the analytical solutions into the machine. And one of the great ways to do it is just make sure the training data is consistent with physics. That's, I think it's a really good idea. Plus, you can use it to infill, to provide additional examples to work with. I, I agree with all that. Now, another thing, I was in a PhD proposal of defense yesterday where we were looking at pins which are physics, physically informed neural networks. Now there's a way you do it there. And what you do there is you encode the physics into the loss function, which I think is, is incredible. And I think our challenge is in geophysics, geoscience engineering to really take stock of what is the known physics and look for those opportunities to encode it into the system. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop there and say one thing, and this is my, my doubt. And my doubt goes like this. If we do know the physical expressions, we know them well, and we can solve it with forward model, and we can invert that well, and we've done that well, the machine may not be better. The machine may be more approximative and may be faster, which I think is really cool because I love the idea of real-time feedback. Um, I want our geomodeling to become like TurboTax. Anybody here use TurboTax? You put in your W2, you find out the estimate, and every dis every entry you put after that affects the return, right? I would like that every time you say, well, I think that this fault could be sealing, you can immediately see how that would affect flow at wells, that kind of thing. Cool, very cool. Hey. Dr. Sen? Yes, uh, just hey, one. Howdy. Hi, how are you? <laughs> good, good. So uh, it's a great talk. I just uh, wanted to follow up on your comment on not being able to capture non-stationarity. If you have non-stationarity in your training data set, why wouldn't it capture it? Yeah, yeah. And, and so this is, and once again, this is where I'm going on a, a bit of a cantilever. And I'm mm -hmm. saying my suspicion, and this is why, and this is probably my bias for my history and my training, my expertise is that I look at machine learning as statistical learning. And so no matter how complicated the machine is, I start to formulate a bunch of conditional probabilities in my head. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I look at that, I, I, I know that the convolutional neural nets can do a good job over the multiple filters, over multiple layers and upscaling and so forth at basically seeing across scales and, and naturally kind of segmenting, but still, and, and people have been doing this with GANs to reproduce images. But what we found is that we needed conditional GANs. That if we were trying to make images of fire trucks and we trained with a bunch of images of cars, fire trucks and planes, that it did kind of jumble it up together. And that's what kind of makes me suspicious that these methods, now, I, I, this is something I want to show. And so I have a student working with images with a variety and controllable and quantified level of non-stationarity. And we're looking at how imports impacts the predictions from the model. Now, I, I, I agree. I, don't, I hope I don't sound like I'm defeatist in saying, because everything we work with is non-stationary. So I'm not saying, I'm just suspecting something. Yeah, the reason I was kind of asking question on this is that we've been trying to 
get non-stationary deconvolution problem to work using machine learning. So we put in the physics of the stationarity and okay. then we put in the data and it actually is working. Okay, good, good. So, so you've, 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 you've informed it. Yes. You've, in a way you've conditioned the model with the physics. Yes, so uh, yeah, most of my work has been, you know, basically building the architecture with the help of the physics of the problem. Anyway, thank you. So I'll see you tonight again. So. Yeah, we'll see you tonight. Thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. I, I would love to read more about your most recent work. Thank you for that. Hey, um, last call for questions. Um, nope. Okay. Well, uh, let's let's all thank uh, Michael, and if you could turn on your video and give him a wave, so he. he hey, if you guys want to turn on a video and take a shot together, can we do a group shot and I can put it on Twitter? <laughs> well, why don't you stop sharing your presentation? Okay, okay, let me do that. Stop share. If you guys are cool, anybody who's comfortable showing themselves on video, I welcome you to turn on your video. And I don't know if you're going to do the hookum or what, you know, like <laughs> you feel strongly about that. I welcome that. Okay. Everybody turn their videos on who's happy to turn on their videos. All right. Hey, nice to see you all. Hey, howdy, folks. Um, okay. All right. I have a couple of people still showing up. All right. All right. So I'm going to take a shot in three, two, one. All right. I got it. Everybody looks great. That turned out. That turned out well. I'll take a. I've got the screen capture right here, and I'll post that on probably tomorrow on Twitter. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate y'all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks everyone.